Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another international workshop with Tayos. Today we have with us Vicky Hurd mm -hmm. from UK. Hello Vicky, how are you? Hi. I'm good, I'm good. A bit cold, but I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to our workshop. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, uh, I'll tell you a little about Wiki. She's an environmentalist, a researcher, and the author of the book Rebugging the Planet, which is the topic for our workshop today. So, uh, like most of us are either scared of bugs and insects or we, do, we dislike them. And we try our best uh, to get rid of them as much as possible. But little do we know that these bugs, these you know, creepy little creatures play a very important role in our ecosystem and they're actually an essential part of our planet. So, uh, and it's important to have uh, uh, them around us, even though we don't like them. So uh, today, Vicky is going to tell us exactly how and why these bugs are important and what we can do to rebug our planet. So it's going to be a very exciting uh, session today uh, to hear from you. Uh, over to you, Wiki. Please enlighten us with your words. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, I thought I'd start just tell you a little bit about myself and why I've written this book um, and then talk a bit about what I found while I was writing it um, and uh, what I found about what people can do because there's loads of ways people can do things to help even if they don't particularly like the bugs but I do want people to like the bugs or at least change their attitude if, if they immediately think of batting them away or squashing them um, but a little bit about me first I'm um, so I'm Vicky Hurd and I started almost by accident as an environmental campaigner way back in 1989 um, I'd done a master's, uh, I'd done a degree in biology and then master's in developing pest management systems. So I'd got an interest in um, insects and bugs and um, that led me to looking at uh, uh, pest management. Um, but I didn't want to spend my life killing pests. So I was looking around for work and I volunteered at an organisation called Friends of the Earth. And, and basically the rest is history, my history. I never went into pest killing or other careers. Um, so. I've been working on campaigns to change government policy um, and international government policy and European um, institution policy for 30 years, um, partly because I love the bugs, but also because it's essential that we get policy around food and farming, because that's what I work on, um, right, in order for our health, our, our personal health and the health of the planet and for environmental welfare to cut zoonoses things like that we're seeing covid as a great example of what you, what happens when you um upset in um the natural systems too much you can get uh diseases that cross barriers and uh, end up infecting us and uh, also we've got critical nature and climate crises so all those things are really affected by how we food and farm how we do energy and transport and buildings as well but i'm particularly interested in the land use side of things so farming and food but i've also retained a, a bug love um i sometimes think that my love of the invertebrate world and it's not just insects it's all of them um but it, it probably was cemented when i was um about 17 years old and i'd been lucky enough to get a job in a big research station and I spent three months in summer very happily sitting next to beehives, honeybee hives, counting them coming and going. And we were doing fantastic research looking at pheromones, which are the chemical cues social insects and other insects use to communicate with each other. Um, and we were testing out different pheromones and what happens to the bees when they go foraging or they do fight behaviour. So I was sitting there for, for several weeks counting them with a little counter and then one bee came out and the buzz that it was making was very different from the buzz that I'd heard for the last few weeks, which was, you know, a wonderful honeybee buzz, no threat, no risks, nothing. And then this bee started circling my head and got louder and more angry sounding and eventually landed on my face. And uh, as it got to my nose, I had to flick it away. I couldn't leave it there <laughs> and I got stung. But I recall oh. that, I know it was a bit of a shock, but I recall that as a really great communication between me and the bee. I knew the bee didn't like me being here. It, it, <laughs> like, it thought I was a threat to the uh, honeybee hive, which they have fantastic 
ways to protect the hive. You know, across the globe, um, you've got different um, bees having different tools to protect um, themselves from invaders and from attacks. And so it was just protecting all the little baby bees in the hive and the worker bees and the foraging bees. And so it was a great communication. And I think that probably got me just so in love with bees and the wider tiny creatures. So it, it was a wonderful job. And a few years ago, I was sitting listening to a um, very, very disturbing report about the loss of invertebrates across the globe. More and more long term studies were showing that they, they were seeing crashes in both numbers of invertebrates from flies to bees to worms. Um, and diversity. So the range of invertebrates, both specialists and generalist bugs that can live anywhere, they're all in trouble, not absolutely everywhere. And, you know, we need more research to see what's been going on. But there are really, really worrying signals. Um, and, you know, there's what one meta study, large study, suggesting that 40 percent of in, in insects are at risk of going extinct. And there are many other worrying things. And I, I talk a bit about that in my book, but I, the book is more about what we can do and, and why we need to do things. Um, but that really worried me. And I, I've been looking at all the wonderful um, rewilding projects. We have rewilding across Europe where you allow nature to recover itself by leaving it alone. You might introduce a, a particularly keystone species, a critical species, like a, a wolf or a particular ruminant into environment, but you leave the environment to recover. But rewilding, most of us don't have large areas of land to rewild. But yes. we are, well, yeah, we we don't have farms or huge estates, but we are all surrounded by wild things every day. Every day you walk out your door or even, you know, in your house, you have wild things. They're just very small. Um, they're wild. And sometimes, you know, you can be frightened of them with, with justification. Um, and there are some that do cause critical harm to humans and to our habitats and things, but they're a very minority. The majority of bugs not only um, don't really do anything, any harm to us, but a huge amount of them are critically important. So in this book, I started to explore what the important things they do for us. And it's things like cleaning our water supply. They do a huge amount of filtering, all those little filter animals, wonderful one called um, uh, a rotifer, tiny, tiny little thing in all water everywhere. And they do a great job cleaning the water for, for contaminants and bits of material. And they, and they convert it into smaller bits, which then can be used by plants in the water system or um, just making it more um, healthy. Obviously, invertebrates like worms and springtails, which are fantastically beautiful little bugs in our soil everywhere. Um, and loads and loads of bugs in the soil are critical for creating soil in which our plants we need for our food, for our fibre, for our fuel, um, and for our wildlife, for our ecosystems. We need the soil to be really healthy. And uh, soil everywhere is being eroded by intensive farming and by um, climate change. So all these things are having a big impact on the invertebrates, but the invertebrates are critical to keep the soil healthy because they, the invertebrates break down the plant matter, which falls on, on um, the uh, soil, breaks it down to, into much smaller matter by digesting it. Um, and it breaks it down so that other microbes and fungi can then release the nutrients as they consume it to for the plants to grow absolutely critical circular system and the insects are a, a essential part of that system amazing. and then there's yeah amazing. yeah no they're really I amazing hear how real, uh, these little things can do so much for our plants they they do and they're also many people will already know that a lot of invertebrates and particularly people know about the bees are critical for pollination about 40 yeah. percent of plants that we rely on for crops to eat from vegetables to coffee and cocoa um, and all sorts of um, cereals and oil seeds do need pollination by invertebrates. And we get it so getting so critical in some parts of the world. I think in China, they're actually having to hand pollinate their um, fruit trees in a, on a large scale because they haven't got enough pollinator insects. And um, yeah, no, it's really terrible. Yeah. yeah. And I talk in the book about what would happen if we really lost all our pollinators. People are talking about the idea of creating robo bees like robotic bees 
and those robotic bees would be in have to be in their billions um and it's such a bad idea because what we should do instead which would be cost a lot less money and be a lot less polluting and is self-replicating would be to protect the pollinators in the first place by yes. um taking taking all sorts of measures to to protect the, the pollinators rather than introducing robotic systems or I, the idea of being able to pollinate those crops by hand which would be you know, it would cost far too much. Anyway, so I looked in um, in the book. So there's this crisis and we need the, the bee, uh, bugs everywhere um, for all sorts of other things. I haven't really, really got time to talk about here, but they, they are really critical for our ecosystems on which we depend for our, our food, our healthy air, healthy soils, for the beauty around us and the nature around us that, that a lot of people do love even if they find some bits of it worrying or frightening. This is absolutely essential that we do something. And the critical thing is we can all do something because the problems for the bugs are multiple. It's things like climate change, it's overuse of pesticides and chemicals um, in the farming system, in, in forests, in um, textile production. Um, I talk quite a bit about textiles and cotton is a particularly um, harmful crop um, because it uses an awful lot of um, pesticides to kill particularly the cotton bollworm which is a, a very big pest of the crop but as a result those those insects are becoming resistant to the chemicals because they can evolve resistant features and they can withstand and also when you take away one pest you get another pest you have this big cycle of pests pest needs and a treadmill yeah. as they say yeah so there's also um so climate change pesticide use removal of habitats now habitats the woodlands the scrubby places the bits of flower rich um road verges all those are really essential places for the bugs to be able to connect with each other so there's a corridor needed for them to connect with each other and repopulate another area to find new mates to find places to nest and lay their eggs so these um habitats the loss of habitats one of the critical problems for invertebrates and and places like um the amazon and some amazing forests in the um in the Turkmenistan, for instance, I, I learned about the loss of many forests for cotton growing. But everywhere forests are being lost, but it's also hedgerows, woodlands, single trees. A single tree can mean the difference between a, a, a insect population surviving or crashing in that area because we're fragmenting the habitats. Um, yeah. But there's also new problems. You might not have heard about this. Um, new problems for insects like plastic pollution. Plastic can break down in the environment to tiny, tiny bits, which then the insects and other invertebrates ingest, such as in marine environments, the, the crabs, yes. slug, you know, um, zooplankton, which are the tiny invertebrates in the in the marine environment, critical for marine environment circulation of nutrients, etc. And so plastic, little tiny plastic bits are beginning to be realised to be a critical problem. And, and that, you know, we really got to stop putting plastic into the environment um, through all the ways that we do. And I talk about that, what you can do in, in the book. There's also um, light and noise pollution, which is a problem for invertebrates, particularly when they use noise to um, talk to each other um, and uh, have vibrations, communications. There are lots of examples of where noise is a really critical problem for invertebrates and for the rest of um, wildlife. Um, and oh, light pollution, really? yeah. So, yeah. Like, uh, it disturbs mm. them, you mean uh, the noise yeah. that is made by humans? Yes, exactly. If we have a large amount of noise, then it can dis okay. disrupt their mating. It can disrupt their um, home seeking habitats. There's an example in the book where a crab seeks um, a shell far more quickly and without being so careful as they normally would be as a result of noise pollution. And that's that's because they're frightened. You know, they, they seek shelter, but the shelter might not be the best one for them in the long term because, you know, these are crabs that use those um, uh habitats for a long time so there's a lot of i mean there's loads there's quite a lot in the book about these things to do okay. with spiders to do with springtails to do with worms all these all these threats to um the insects but as a result we've all got a role to play we can all do something to help them and the other thing i talk about in the book is what we can learn for from the invertebrates you know it's amazing how we are you know there's loads of examples in the book 
about how we're learning to build buildings better. The termites, for instance, yes, termites can be a big problem. They're brilliant at mining through um, habitations, but we can build in ways that actually stop them being a problem. But also we can learn from them because they have incredible building capacity. The, the walls that they create are fantastic at keeping out cold, um, keeping moisture in at the right levels. They're also brilliant at communicating. They have ways of communicating, as do other social insects like the ants and um, the wasps and the bees. These are all insects that have evolved billions of years before us. And they are so clever at communicating and working together in a way that means that they survive and thrive and can breed new generations um, well in a particular environment. And they work together so brilliantly, I think we could learn a lot from them. And in fact, people are, are learning from them. There's something called the internet. They're learning how to do algorithms on the internet um, through what ants do. And you know, oh, wow. so there's loads of examples, yeah. And there's wonderful examples from, um, insect skeletons you know just by the insect design insect skeletons there's one bug called the um oh i'm going to forget the name now uh anyway they've got an exoskeleton made of chitin which is a protein collagen mix and and okay. you know we're looking at how we can make materials like that that are light and strong um and we also use insects in medicine. Leeches are actually being used still in medicine and maggot therapy to clean wounds. It's much more effective at cleaning yeah. certain wounds yeah, um, by using maggots. And they're using that in America a lot. It's And it actually goes down really well. Anyway, so okay. many ways, so many ways do we can learn. Do people really go for that? Like, uh, the yeah, they do. And they, they, yeah, they respond to it really well, apparently. Um, okay. It's a way of it's a way of um, looking after your wound without having to use chemicals, and things like that. You're using maggots yeah. and then you can take them away at the end. It's really clever. And people aren't so squirmish as you, you might imagine. <laughs> but uh, we're also using these spider thread to look at how we can make um, strong fibers. And oh, it, it's endless what we can learn from them. But I also think we can learn from them about how to live lightly on our planet. They don't waste they don't waste food um they don't attack unless they need to you know they don't, there's yeah. so many ways we we as humans could learn i think and there's oh. even there's even i was amazed to find those cockroaches called they, they're called the um uh maternal oh gosh again my brain's gone mad but there's a cockroach which actually produces milk for its babies it actually produces oh. a very protein and mineral rich milk and you wouldn't have thought of that, would you, from your invertebrates, and especially not your beetles that you might not like. So um, it's really incredible to, to learn about that. And in the book, I go on to then talk about, you can see how brilliant they are, how important they are for our food, for our water, for our air, um, so many ways. So what can you do to help? And one of the biggest ways you can do is about what you, you eat um, and what you um how you eat, where you buy food from. And and one of the ways that people don't often really make a connection with the invertebrates is by eating less junk food. Because junk food, like high sugary, salty fat food, very cheap, um, high street, fast food, all those kind of things, they're full of um, products that have come from a, a very intensive monoculture system that is very large fields of the same crop or very large herds of the same livestock. And that means that you've got to use a lot of chemicals to protect that crop or that livestock because they're, a, a, you know, they're going to be attacked by one particular disease because they've got a, a fantastic array of food before them. They're very vulnerable to pests and um, uh, other, other attacks and disease attacks. So, you know, if you're, if you're having big monocultures and uniform crops over a last, vast area to produce cheap food, that's a problem for the invertebrates and they lose their habitats, they lose of chemicals, loads of ways in which it's harmful. And there's, you know, greenhouse gases emissions involved in that as well, which is harmful to the invertebrate. So buying fresh food and cooking fresh as much as you can, or at least minimally processed is a really good way. The other one is about eating less and better meat. Um, because meat uses, um, meat production uses vast amount of land, either for grazing and grazing can be done well, grazing with a, a really good management system and a really mixed biodiverse rich land can be great but when it's um the animals are intensively grazed or they're actually all housed and fed with grains and proteins like soya and cereals that is huge land take 
land that could be feeding humans or could be restored to nature um, and therefore the bugs and uh, so eating lightly through your meat consumption is, is a really good idea eating less but eating better if you, if you want to eat meat so only going for um, products that you know the provenance from so look for labels like pasture based and things um, I mean on a global level this might be harder to do might be easier to do for some people but think before you buy food and where you're buying it from and support farmers rather than the big food industry where you can you know trying to buy direct is brilliant because the farm will get more money and then they'll be able to do things in ways which are good for the for the land that they're looking after they won't have to intensify because they get such a low price so yeah, i explore absolutely. explore yeah That's and and also idea. eating yeah so eating those kind of things but also eating diverse eating a variety of things because bugs need variety and we need our farming to be able to diversify. So that means the market, i.e. us, us who eat the food, need to sort of be eating different things, you know, and eating things that are good to grow, like pulses and legumes, that the um, peas and beans, they're really good in a rotation for farmers and um, because they actually um, bring nitrate into the soil. They're nitrogen fixing, so you can use less fertilizers. Anyway, you're getting a bit technical here, but um, trying to, to diversify your food, less junk, try and get it from really good farmers or as uh, can you know, I, can from I market. Just, uh, mm. Sorry, interrupt yeah. you in between mm. here. When yeah. you, we talk about uh, fertilizers mm. and sexicides and pesticides, like mm. these are like we have learned that these are essential to uh, mm. have a healthy crop. So yeah. uh, what uh, do you mm. say? Like we should not be using these? Yeah, it's a it's a difficult one. I mean, we've been using, for instance, a, a um, insecticide called neonicotinoids. That's the the uh -huh. um, group of insecticides that have been unbelievably effective at destroying the um, pests in crops globally. But they've now been banned in Europe largely um, and in in the UK because we found out that they're critically harmful for the wild populations of insects that we need for pollination for the bees oh, okay. and other other many other insects pollinate our plants moths spiders wasps everything um it's not just the bees and these neonicotinoids we've only found recently do so much harm so one of the problems is the testing regime for the chemicals isn't good enough it doesn't test the whole impact of the um, the chemical, nor does it test how the chemical works with other chemicals that are using in the system. The cocktail that can be actually worse than the individual chemicals themselves. So what we are looking for is in, in terms of policy that farmers use chemicals as a very last resort and ideally not at all. But they need support in doing that. And um, yes. that means supporting farmers in transition to agroecological farming systems. So more diverse, more rotations, building up the predators that can eat the pest disease. A lot of wasps are actually brilliant at um, uh, being predators. They, ha they eat the invertebrates that you don't want in the crop. And a lot of bug, um, beetles, you know, like ladybugs, you might know as ladybugs, we call them ladybirds yes. here. Yeah, they're yes, fantastic. That's, that's just mm. one bug that I really like. <laughs> yeah, they're lovely, they're beautiful, Cute. but they're also yeah. brilliant in a garden environment. They're brilliant for eating aphids and aphids can be a real pain in your, in your garden and in a crop. Uh -huh. And so if you build up these populations by not using chemicals, you can build up populations of the predators of the bugs, like beetles, like wasps um, and, and other. Um, there's a whole range of um, things like parasitoids, which uh, lay their eggs on the, the um, pest maggots and uh, the eggs hatch and eat the maggots. So you've got amazing, wow. amazing interactions that can happen within a field, but not if it's drenched with chemicals. So, but yeah. it's, all this is very difficult for farmers because they've been told for half a century that chemicals are brilliant and they'll do the job and fertilizers, you need fertilizers, but all those things cost money. Um, but they do mean but that you we can get good a, results from that. So, you get, uh, yeah, yeah, you get, you get people. it. Yeah, they were greedy people. I mean, it's worth noting you say that we're greedy people, we actually globally throw away, um, and it's possibly particularly bad in in um uh, it is particularly bad in uh, countries like mine throw away 30 percent of the food that is produced and a lot of the food that is produced is wasted in transit as well or it's rejected yes. by the you know rejected by the supermarkets not looking perfect so you know we if we ate less meat because that uses a load of crops if we wasted less we certainly wouldn't need to um massively increase 
the yields in the field so we could cope with a certain amount of loss as long as you're building up those predators and you're building up the fertility of the soil so the plants can actually grow and fight off the disease or fight off the infestation because that's one of the things that organic farmers know that when they've got a healthy crop they have far less problems with pests and disease and they have a lot of rotation so you don't build up a, a pest or a fungi in a particular field there's loads of measures but they're very knowledge based whereas a chemical yes. you can just zap it you don't need to know much else you just put it on the crop <laughs> so yeah. it's about it's about a big learning curve and a transition and supporting yeah farmers and uh, it requires way. a lot of patience and yeah uh, yeah and risk yeah. yeah but the more consumers like us are actually um supporting that about what we buy um then the better it will be for farmers. This is a, a big thing and it needs global action as well as national action to start that transition. Because we, we are in a crisis, if we lose the invertebrates any further, it's a crisis for the whole environment. So, you know, yes, we need food in large num amounts, but we can do it differently if we eat differently and don't waste any food. The worst thing you can waste is meat, yes. but uh, wasting any food is a, is a bad idea. So there's whole ways you can reuse, you know, bits bits of food in soups and stuff like that. But it's also about what you wear and your cl your furniture and your towels and your bedding, because all those products, most of those products, come from a natural environment um, through, and they're cellulose through um, uh, woody products. But most of them are things like cotton or wool or leather. Um, and those all have an impact environment, which could be good or it could be bad. What I talk about in the book is um, looking at the labels, trying to buy organic if you can, organic cotton, or organic wool products or, or um, leather from people you, you know, producers you can trust. So there haven't been a huge amount of chemicals or very intensive farming systems. But one of the things that we've really gone to town with the last century is buying um, clothes made from plastics, made from f fossil fuels and so poly um nylon polyethylene all those things yes. so they're plastic they're artificial fibers when you put them in the washing machine um yes i'll go on to the habits how we change to help the bugs so i'm talking about it here in terms of your textile how we can help the bugs because when you buy a cotton product if that cotton has been produced in a heavily pesticide filled crop then that's going to be really bad for the um uh, for the bugs and so that that's one of the things so what you wear makes a big difference and plastics are just as bad if you don't think so i say the one of the best clothes you're wearing is the one you're wearing now try and reuse don't buy so many clothes don't waste any clothes things like that so just that's that's one of the um things that i talk about but the other um chapter in the book which i think is really important um and i'll, I'll show some slides in a minute to slightly illustrate the point is to rebug our attitudes so i talked at the beginning about the th thing we really do need to do is to think about how we react to bugs because when we have children around us if we're caring for children if we instill in children a sense that bugs are horrible they're going to kill you they're dirty mustn't have any bugs anywhere then children will very quickly lose their curiosity and interest in bugs and start to fear them so and that's true so you as individuals can really help the next generation to understand the importance of bugs and how they can help them more so it's that rebugging your attitude um and thinking more about what you can do to help that so i um if we can show some slides um these are just some a few slides of bugs that i've taken in my garden because one of the things i've started to do is take the photographs to show what's on your doorstep you're surrounded by wonderful wildlife that is actually very beautiful um and uh, are you able to show the slides now yeah so this is i've got a tiny garden and I grow. Can you see this now? I can't actually know, but um, I can't see the slides. I do anyway, it, have, have a go, it. and I'll explain. I'll explain. Um, do you need me to, to press anything, or mm. no? No, you'll be able okay. to see it. Okay, can't see it now. But um, yeah, it's lots of bugs. And because I've got a, um, a quite a good smartphone, not, not the latest, but a smartphone, I can take pictures of the bugs and then zoom in and show just how amazing they are the variety they are how beautiful they are and then it can share those photographs with people online and social media with your friends and family and colleagues and show that there is wildlife on your doorstep that you could be doing something about through how you garden 
through, you know, even if you haven't got a garden, if you've got a windowsill, having pots with flowers can help provide a, a corridor or a refuge for invertebrates on your doorstep. And then if you've got any way of helping the um, uh, with local green patches, like say if there's a green, um, there's a park near you or a grassy verge, you can help rewild that bit of grassy verge so there's more um, flowers, so they've got um, food to eat, so they can take the nectar, pollinate those flowers, or act as a refuge, or if you've got a bush, they, you know, they can um, actually live in it, lay their um, nests, have their nests in those bushes. So create habitats all around you where you work, maybe, even if it's a, a concrete building, you can put things on the roof or in the windowsills or maybe a driveway, all things where you can put a small amount of flowers to help the bugs in your area. That way, an urban environment um, can be as rich, and in some cases actually richer, than the rural environment because you're creating loads of habitats and a refuge and not using chemicals, things like that. And also you're right, helping people to recognise what there is around them because they'll see if, they, if a, the bit was just a bit of dirt, suddenly is a beautiful flowering patch with not much effort, not much cost, they will start to see, oh, how beautiful our planet can be. Let's protect it. Let's protect the bugs that are pollinating these, these flowers so they grow again next year and more grow. So it's about um, rewilding through rebugging on your doorstep and in, you know just around you. And the big, the big things you can do in your garden or in your parks or your green verges is to try and avoid chemicals. Um, that's a key thing. But one of the most important things, and this is what I do in my garden, and which I, I was hoping to show you pictures, but doesn't. Oh, there, there we go. Maybe we're seeing them now. Um, okay. Yes, there we go. There's the pictures. So if you go to the next slide. Okay. Um, yeah. So this was a moth, a vapor moth that came into my garden and into my kitchen. So I was rescuing it with my hands and taking it outside. Oh my <laughs> and my and there's antennae. Those are the tools for listening, you know, listening for other moths in the area, listening out for mates. They're fantastic, aren't they? It's just a wonderful beast. Yeah. Totally harmless, brilliant pollinator. Moths are, are really critical pollinators and they're very beautiful. Most of them you don't see um, during the day because they're not um, day flying. But at nighttime, they are doing an incredible job pollinating your plants um, and so you know protecting the moths by providing them habitats and, and flowering plants and things is really critical and saving them if they get stuck in your kitchen um go to the next one now um and the next one is a now this is a um hornet mimic hoverfly so it's trying to make itself look like a um a hornet which can sting but it doesn't sting it's beautiful look at those colors and they're again a fantastic um how do you manage uh, to uh, like take the picture of them yeah so I, that's, uh, yeah, pictures. I, that's with my phone i've got a smartphone and i was probably about okay. five five feet away so then i can zoom in um okay. once once the bug has flown i can zoom in and get a much closer picture um it's not a great i'm not a great photographer I've got no skills and my phone isn't that brilliant. So we can all do it, you know, if you happen to have a smartphone if, or a camera, it's brilliant. And this, okay. this is not only a brilliant um, pollinating, but they also um, a pest control because they um, can take other pests like um, ca caterpillars. If you, if you feel caterpillars are a problem on your, um, on your crops, on your vegetable crops, however, they will um, uh, eat those. So they're really good at pest control. They're really good at pollinating. So keep the um, ho hoverflies going if you can. And I've got loads of different varieties in a tiny garden that I have. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a um, red admiral came my garden late last year and to have a bit of a warm up in the sun. And I think they overwinter as adults. So having dark spaces like cellars or um, uh, sheds they can go in there and just hide away for the for the winter. So keeping some dark spaces and other other animals um, like leaf litter. So in your garden, if you leave some leaves in a pile and even better leaves and a log pile, log piles are brilliant for beetles and other bugs because they lay their eggs, the eggs hatch and the animals can eat a bit of food because they eat, eat the um, logs. They can um, they can manage to get through the logs and it's wonderful when you see the beetles emerging and the beetles again are brilliant at um, uh, pest control um, but butterflies and others are pollinators as well next slide um, and this is a crab a flower crab spider I should have warned people who might be frightened of spiders I've got a few spiders but they but they're really harmless and again brilliant pest control they also do eat 
um, hov um, your honeybees and bees. So you might think, oh, they're a real pest because we need the honeybees for the pollination. But the crab spiders also eat a lot of flies and a lot of um, pests of um, uh, herbivores that eat plants. So I talk about the book, new research showing that um, some plants give off chemicals that attract the flower crab. Um, and that so that they the plant is detecting that it's being attacked by a herbivorous insect. And so it'll let off a chemical and attract the crab spider to come and eat the insects. So oh, it's a, wow. a way of, you know, mutual benefit because the yeah. crab gets some food and the plant gets some control. There are loads of examples out there. And in my book, I've, I've covered some where plants and insects work together for mutual benefit. So mutualism. And it's extraordinary. Some of them are so specialized. But you can all you all know about them anyway, because things like the moss with their long proboscis tongue, they've evolved the right kind of tongues to get to a specific flower and um and you know and then they pollinate that particular plant in a particular way so these re these relationships have evolved over thousands of years next slide please and this is a, a mint moth i just think it's very pretty it's tiny and it's on a mint plant so i just think that's nice it's in my garden every year i see the mint moths and uh they're poll pollinators that's and beautiful before, mm -hmm. yeah next slide please and this another um, very frequent visitor in London in our gardens is the garden spider. I just thought it was rather beautiful sitting there in my jasmine, um, hiding away. <laughs> and, uh, again, fantastic pest control. If you don't like your flies, let the spider run alive. Spiders in a house and, and in fact, wasps will eat vast amounts of flies. If you don't like flies, get the wasps in and the spiders in. Next slide. Um, yeah, this is just another um, moth, a Jersey tiger moth, which is a visitor to the UK. I just think it's very beautiful. And I managed to catch both sides because it landed on my window and uh, with that beautiful orange colour. And then the other side is that beautiful mottled. Um, Amazing. Uh, yeah, beautiful. Next slide. That's a tiger moth. And another hoverfly. I, I thought this was particularly stunning. Hook banded wasp. Again, it's trying to pretend it's a wasp. It's not a wasp. It won't sting you, but it will pollinate your plants and it will um, lay eggs on your pest um, maggots. And those eggs will hatch and eat the maggots. So if you don't want your veg, veg patch eaten by cabbage um, patch uh, caterpillars, then uh -huh. get some get some hoverflies in. So Next how slide, do we please. identify like which uh, bug is uh, useful which, which, and which? Well, and most of them. Helpful. Yeah, most of them are. I have to say, I'm going to say most of them are because if you start worrying about all of them and you think, "Oh, well, I must get some chemicals on my crops to protect them," uh -huh. um, instead of thinking about different ways to to with, um, uh, resist the pests that are a pest, um, if if you think all of them are bad, then um, that's going to cause problems. What you need to think of is most of them are good. And you can look online now if you have got access to a computer or your phone, look online and there's lots of identification um, uh, apps now which you can identify bugs and things from. Uh, I should have put that in the um, in the talk. I haven't apologised about that. But uh, there are ways to identify things. I, you know, you, if you put the uh, picture online, you can often get it identified by somebody who's an expert. Um, this, I mean, you know, I'm not an expert. Again, I'm, I'm really not. I'm an environmental campaigner, but I've managed to find out this is a hook band in wasp, wasp or hoverfly yeah. quite quickly. Yeah. But um, knowing which are, are wasp, which are bad and which are good, I think most people should think most of them are good. And that's okay. that's going to change our attitude and change our habits in our gardens, um, which I think will be critical. Start to do more messy bits in your garden and you'll have more space for the good stuff. Start to mix up your plants so have more diverse. Don't have one huge grass lawn, which has to look perfect. I actually, when I see a grass, a perfect grass lawn now, I think it's horrible because not only does it use lots of chemicals, and lots of you know pesticides, um, herbicides, and fertilizers. It's also one single crop, one one ryegrass, and it's boring, and it provides very little food or habitat for the bugs. So I would say that. Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is just. I was very happy in lockdown over um, you, during the pandemic last year. I created a little pond in my tiny garden, and I was very pleased to see a wolf spider coming and drinking from it. So that made me very happy. I was providing some uh, thirst quenching for a, a spider, which again, spiders, great pest control. Very beautiful when you look at them close. I know a lot of people are 
nervous but um try <laughs> try and not be um and certainly don't squash them um unless you know they're, they're a particular um risk and that you know the, the, around the world there are some that are are risky so get to know which are and it's all online you can find out which are a risk and which aren't um to okay. give you a not, you know, nasty bite very few and they they actually far more risk from you than you are from them usually next yeah. slide please <laughs> next slide again this is a crab spider i love this picture so i put it in and it's eating a bee sad but it'll also eat lots of flies that are pests and things like that and everybody deserves to live don't they um yeah. so we have actually a huge amount of honey um, bees in the country so it's not such a risk it's when they start eating the the wild rare wild solitary bees that might be a problem but uh, they don't there's a balance in nature and mostly that balance is destroyed by human activities yeah. anyway next next slide um so another hoverfly and on the left i had a wonderful day i was lying in the garden reading a book um a few summers ago and i i noticed a little bee a solitary bee was hovering around all these patches on my lawn my lawn as you can see is not a perfect lawn it's got lots of things in it and it has patches and there were holes in the patches and that it is a tawny mining bee and the tawny mining bee is making a hole and laying an egg and with the egg the bee will put some pollen and some um nectar and cover it up so that the egg when it hatches it has some food and wow. so it's a beautiful little thing and the solitary bees uh are very very important again as pollinators and you you know they often nest in small places like holes in the ground or in walls so if you can leave some holes in your wall or your fence or your ground or in your house walls you might find that you become a hotel for for some solitary bees and yes. in the uk at the moment everybody's building bee hotels you know little oh. hotels with bamboo and you can build them and it, it's really easy you can do it for free and you can provide a home for some really useful bees next slide please interesting hmm. uh worms we all love worms i hope i had a wonderful moment when my um youngest child was i think um he was about two and he came into the garden or three and he came in with a hand full of full of worms you know um oh my god earth covered worms <laughs> into the garden and i was i was delighted because i can see he was curious he thought they were brilliant what are these craw crawly things that i've managed to take them again <laughs> and yet a lot of people might say oh that's dirty you're going to get sick you're not largely as long as you clean the hands afterwards look after the child and um, worms are so important for for everything they create they aerate the soil they allow water to go through it um they transfer microbes from one habitat to another so they make the soil healthy because the help the so health of the soil depends on microbes and fungi and protists and all sorts of tiny tiny animals go through their stomach or on their skin and they're really really important so i'm really glad i instilled a love of worms in my son um and they're uh, globally they're everywhere and they're also threatened everywhere particularly by climate change but also by um harm to the soil than which they um, need so when you're doing a lot of churning of the soil through ploughing or using chemicals um, or removing plant matter they need to eat next slide please these are all in my garden remember my tiny tiny garden this is a ladybird larvae so you imagine ladybirds as um, uh, beautiful little beetles with red and spots and things like that yes. this one is its larvae before it turns oh, into okay. the bee, but before it turns, you know, it becomes an egg and then it turns into this larvae and then it turns into the beetle. And here it's eating a pest caterpillar there. You can see it's eating it and they're very voracious um, carnivores, the um, ladybirds. You don't think to look at them that they look really pretty little, little beetles. Their larvae are really voracious eaters. So you can spot them in the garden. They're usually black with red marks. There's loads of different varieties, but so there's the harlequin. Next slide, please. It's a very keen observation. Like you have yeah. pictures of uh, all the, mm -hmm. so you have so much yeah. time to sit there and observe these little creatures. Well, I in. Can, <laughs> this is over. This is over several years, I have to say. Okay. Um, and I, you know, and but the reality is because my garden, I've left lots of things to grow that are good habitat for and and um, food for the uh, invertebrates. There's a lot in there. This is a garden, um, garden tiger moth caterpillar. Next slide. I hope nearly finished, I think. And this was a holly blue butterfly. I was very pleased to find this in my garden. And that's a, a what many people would call a call a, a weed species of plant. I've let it grow. Um, and it's a beautiful pollinating, um, uh, a beautiful plant for all sorts of pollinators to drink from to get their nectar. I just thought it was very pretty. Next slide. I think it might be the end. 
nope, one more. Buff-tail bumblebee having a feast in a in a salvia plant. Next slide. And these are illustrations that um, uh, my illustrator in the book, Ned Page, has done. So I just thought I'd put that up so you can see. If you buy my book, um, you can see some of the illustrations of some of the bugs that I've found, but also some that are not in my garden. That middle one is a tardigrade. That probably is in my garden, actually. Tardigrades are incredible. They're not insects. They're a, a form all of their own, and they, they're extraordinary because they can withstand nuclear radiation. They can withstand being dehydrated completely. They can oh. stand amazing heats. And they've even been sent up to the moon um, to see how they cope with the conditions oh of the moon. So um, and the top side is you know, the front and which side is the back for the sun. That, that's a good question. <laughs> they've got wonderful names as well because they're called tardigrades, but they're also called, um, here anyway, uh, moss piglets, because you usually find them in moss, in moist moss environments, but they're often in water environments, and also um, water piglets. So they're really gorgeous animals and very, very important in all sorts of ways because they, they uh, in water environments, they convert plant matter into nutrients and things like that. And the top left is the dung beetle, which globally is a very critically important um, species for converting livestock waste um, and fecal matter into useful nutrients. So in the soil, very important in livestock systems. Um, next slide. I think it's the end. Yeah, that, that bee in, in that picture, it's actually, this is the one where I've broken my rule. It's not in my garden. It was an organic farm that I visited this year, and I just thought it was beautiful. It's in, um, be right in the middle of the flower, pollen, you know, getting its nectar, picking up pollen, um, and that's a uh, carder, a common carder bee. So that's the end of the slideshow. Um, so just to end, how much time have I got? Um, I should probably finish. So I've talked about... Um, the problems for for the bugs and what you can do one of the critical things is that rebugging your attitude when you talk to people and how you can talk to your friends your family your colleagues anybody you meet not not anybody you meet but talk to them about you know about what you found and and um in your garden for instance or why they might want to think differently about bugs but certainly the children instill in children that most bugs are fine and we should be looking after them not squashing them leave them alone if you don't want to be near them leave them alone <laughs> but you can also rebug your shopping you can rebug your clothes you know wear clothes don't don't keep buying um loads of clothes um and if you want one thing to do i think um think about having a bug plan a rebugging plan so you know have do one thing differently um in your garden one thing differently when you shop and one thing differently about um sharing your interest in the bugs with other people and so that's a bit of a plan um, and particularly in your garden leaving a bit of a patch uncultivated is a critically brilliant thing to do so it's just the, the flower let the flowers and weeds grow as they will or leave a wood pile because the beetles would love that loads of things there's loads of tips in my book like a little um, the book isn't huge um, but it's got boxes all the way through showing how amazing these bugs are. And they are incredible. They're, they're really incredible. But also what you can do. Loads of tips in there all the way through. Um, so I should probably leave it there. And if there's any questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, can mm. you like tell us like uh, when we are doing home gardening. So yeah. if we are attacked by a mm. pest mm. or a bug uh, mm. on our plants. Uh, mm. So what can we do? to protect yes. the plant but mm -hmm. to not harm the bug as well yes yeah well that's a really that's a really good question i mean there are things you can buy for instance if we're talking about slugs and snails um they can be a real pest in your garden i've got lots of snails in my garden and they are a pest so there's many there's several things you can do um you can buy something called um a biocontrol um and that's in the form of nematode eggs and you get this sort of, it's almost like powder and it's, they're nematodes. And when you, you disperse them in water and spray them in your garden and you're doing something which isn't chemicals, it's just a natural, naturally occurring nematode worm, tiny little worm. And it'll infect some of the snails and slugs, um, preferably a lot of them, and they'll become less of a threat to your garden. Um, what, what I think you can do is put up with a bit of, bit of pests because if you have a few pests then you'll provide a food source for the predators of those pests so if you remove all the aphids by zapping your whole you know garden um with chemicals and getting rid of all the aphids there'll be nothing for the predators the beetles and um other predators of aphids to eat so they won't like your garden they won't come in so that's one thing to think about leaving a 
bit of a pest, but also making your garden more diverse. Because if you if you have um, one single, like I talked about the grass, if you have one single crop or one, you know, if you're just doing roses or just doing potatoes or manioc or whatever, then you'll be providing a, a, a it's very risky because you're, you're, you're putting what we, I would say all your eggs in one basket. You know, you've got a risk that a pest will come in and take all that crop. Whereas if you have more mixed crops and mix it through the years, have a rotation, which is different crops, different times or different parts of your garden. That's absolutely key. And a lot of good organic farmers and farmers do as well have far more rotations. Um, so they're rotating different crops at different times um, rather than having sort of just three rotations of the same crops every three years. Yeah. And, you know, that that can build really big pest and disease problems in your soil and in your environment. So having diversity, having messy bits for the um, predators to, to live, looking into buying some biological controls like that nematode. And there were many others um, that you can buy online, but you can build your own pest control environment by building up really friendly places for the um uh for the um predators of your pests um and the other thing to do is i mean it depends how big your garden and how big you're talking about you actually do physical removal you know go and go and pick those snails and put them somewhere else um and there are other things you can do physical barriers um you know making sure you've got some um uh, copper wire around your pots if you've got pots and copper wire the slugs and snails don't like to go through them um okay. and yeah so so things that you can do physical barriers and coverings for your plants if they are at particular risk at any time of the year of being infested um and actually choosing plants that are resistant i've got um a big snail problem in my garden so i'm going to i've decided to grow a lot of rosemary which is a herb. I think uh, everybody knows about rosemary. Yes, it's a wonderful, yes. wonderful herb. Yeah. And and they don't like it. Most of the bugs don't like it. It survives. It's, it's been around for thousands of years and it's, it's, it's very, it's got great defenses against okay. bugs. So you can have, you know, walls of rosemary around your particularly precious plant. Um, and you can have trap crops as well, like um, nasturtiums will be are very attractive to the plants they produce beautiful flowers as well and nasturtium plants you can eat the leaves and the flowers nasturtiums are an intriguing crop but they're also very attracted to the bugs so you can surround your crops with the nasturtium plants as a trap so the bugs eat the nasturtiums and leave your crop alone loads yeah. of different tips things to do um there's loads so of you, tips online have you mentioned hmm? uh, talked about these tips in your book yeah Yep, oh, I couldn't okay. go. In, I couldn't go into masses of detail, but I put most of those yes. in. Um, but you can often look online as well. But have a look in my book. See, you know, some areas. And in the back of the book, there's lots of organisations with their websites that you can access loads of information for free. Um, and uh, like Garden Organic in the UK has loads of great tips on gardening organically, and they sell lots of products as well. But there's loads of stuff online, and the organic bodies are very willing to talk about what you can do in your garden. Um, across the globe there's there's really useful information but also in my book but you know i i give all those websites in my um in the back of the book there's loads of um contacts information um and you also yeah share your knowledge share how you've learned how to do it as well become part of a, a rebugging community in your town or your village and uh share share that knowledge and and the interest yeah, so uh, that is uh, about plants, but uh, when we're talking about bugs, do we consider the uh, mosquitoes, the mm. uh, the bed bugs? Yes. Please come into mm. this category too. Yes, well, one of the, the things, I mean, particularly when we're talking about um, domestic pests like bed bugs and mosquitoes, uh -huh. um, obviously the best thing we can do is, is, and this is what I learned when I was doing my pest management degree, and it still stands now, the best thing is to um, keep them out. So having barriers to their entry. And this can be true of um, food pests as well, like um, uh, uh, weevils that get into flower. Ensure that they can't get in. And I talk about that book and, and how you can sort of look for holes and, and sort of have um, uh, things like peppermint oil can repel those bugs from coming in but also having you know stopping the entry of the um insect pests is one of the best ways and also removing their ability to get at food so in, if the food is literally flour or other um, products in your kitchen cover them up don't have them on display for the invertebrates to smell and come in and get uh -huh, but but yeah. stop their entry remove the food but if the food source is you 
as in for mosquitoes and other biting bugs. That's that, the that's, problem in it uh, India, mm, mosquitoes, yeah. and we get a lot of diseases like malaria and dengue. It's very common during yeah. the rainy season. So uh, what yeah. are your tips on how to control this? Yes, well, there, there's several things we can do. I mean, obviously, in real obviously situations we need to use the chemicals we need to use the chemicals and we we should be using um anti-malarial um pest insecticides that aren't harmful to other bugs um or trying to use them in ways that aren't harmful to other bugs i mean one of the obvious tools is to remove their means of reproduction so they reproduce in water their mosquito in the larvae are born in water so removing standing water or making sure any standing water is covered so they can't come in and lay their eggs um that's one of the critical tools um and keeping them out having um uh, mosquito nets and other things at night time to keep them out again it's not making you the food source is, is critical but in in many situations that you know when you've got a particular environments you, you we will have to use the chemicals um and so we should be using the ones that are least harmful to other animals and using them very carefully um but keeping a keep removing the means for them to feed or to lay eggs is one of the biggest forms of of um pest control as well but in these situations we will have to use chemicals um and is equally for other other bugs uh, you might have to use chemicals if they're spreading diseases it's absolutely critical that we do that i'm i'm not i'm not a, a purist in that respect but i do think we need to look at all the options and making sure that you we, think yeah. they, uh, like chemicals in moderation uh, yes. is not, is not mm. a big issue like but using yes. it uh, too yeah. much that will harm the other invertebrates is uh, something yeah, exactly the there is another there is another harm as well if you use the chemicals too much then the invertebrates become resistant because they yes. are reproducing in such like numbers yeah they, they can yes <laughs> yeah they can build up their cockroaches are unbelievable yes. animals they're can resistant you tell to us so much about cockroaches? Mm. like uh, this mm. is a major problem mm. uh, to cockroaches mm. so how can we avoid them do we should we yeah. kill them or not I think if they are a, a problem for you, you've got to kill them. Um, if you're worried about, inf you know, um, disease spreading so they disease, they multiply very, mm. very quickly. Mm. But they also they it's a, it's the issue about not giving them access to food sources. So making sure all your food sources are covered and not giving them entry. So making sure if you can closing any you know gaps or cracks in your housing in your stores to make sure they can't get in. Um, but they are incredibly resilient and uh, resourceful animals. Um, so all those things are, are really yeah, important. Yeah, the oldest species mm. on the planet. <laughs> yes, all of them. But uh, if, we use, if we use too many chemicals, the chemicals will become useless because the invertebrates will just develop resistance. Yes. They'll have a way of having a different coating on their skin or their, the way in which the insecticide works will stop working because they'll have developed a, a change in their DNA so they can with, withstand that particular mode of action of the chemical. So if you overuse chemicals, so we need to use what we call integrated Very pest management. Mm, yeah. 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 Okay. I do love cockroaches though. I think they're incredibly oh uh, incredible. <laughs> incredible insects i remember living in ecuador and i i came into a room and the whole room changed color as i walked in because all the cockroaches moved up the sides oh my yeah. god yeah so, uh, like, uh, what is the benefit of the cockroach we have known and seen all the uh bad effects mm. that yeah. they have but can you tell us one yes. good thing about them? yes they're brilliant <laughs> they're brilliant at waste management as are a lot of the flies you know we don't like flies really but they do an incredible job converting dead bodies uh dead animals old old plant matter old food matter into much more digestible um uh, sources of nutrients for other invertebrates or other uh, for plants to grow so they're incredibly across the globe they're incredibly important in it, for instance in a woodland environment they're very important for converting waste matter into useful nutrients so they do have a role probably some of them are, are pollinators as well some of the smaller species will be pollinators um and uh yeah so they, they, every, everything everything has a role where they become a problem is probably where we've created the environment that's just too good for them yeah um, they created yeah. them for a reason they're not there yes. uh, for nothing yeah exactly um somebody's asked how we can access um, yes. in india um, there are the Amazon, I hate to say Amazon, um, you can buy it from their global um, uh, global marketplace, but there is another bookshop. I should have looked it up before I came online, but uh, I'll try and find it while we're talking because it is possible to buy it um, on a global level 
Um, I don't know if it's in Indian bookshops at the moment, um, but I did check with my publishers when they were going to look into it, but they haven't yet. But do ask for it in your bookshop, and you, ideally they'd uh, they'd uh, let you know. But um, I've got a website, rebuggingtheplanet.org, which um, I, I've put all the um, web, the websites where you can buy it. So I'll just put that in the chat. So it's on um, it's on there. So I'll have a go. Uh, and yeah, in mm, the uh, description mm, also we have mm, shared the uh, mm, ebook mm, link that you provided. As oh, great! To read this. Oh yes, yeah, that's good. Yeah, actually, I can't seem to leave a chat, but it's rebuggingtheplanet.org, all, all one word, and uh, you can see all the sources of the book. But there's an ebook as well. Um, I find that very funny that somebody's read my words out, <laughs> but uh, there's lots of tips in there, so you might you'll find it useful. Yeah. Uh, amazing that was like a very enlightening and a wonderful session and to know how bugs are useful to us was uh, something uh, very interesting to know yeah <laughs> obviously to buying or buying organic food and doing organic gardening is going to be a brilliant thing for the bugs goes without saying i think yeah you're doing a lot uh, to yes, help a lot of uh, mm. farmers mm. are uh, mm. opting for organic uh, mm. uh, farming nowadays it's mm. uh, coming in slowly mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we um, need it to yeah we need it to get going. Um, yes. Definitely. Mm. Yes. I, mm. Any last words, uh, Vicky, that you would like mm. to uh, give to our audience? I think my key thing would be to spread the word and get people to understand. You know, read obviously buy my book if you if you can or listen to it, um, and start to think just slightly differently about how you do your gardening or do your shopping, wear your clothes um, and um, try and have a share the planet. It's all about sharing this one planet that we've all got that we call home um, with the bugs, which do so much for us um, and try and instill that in others, particularly children. That would yes. be what I'd say. Yeah. The more you can do that, the better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky, for sharing My uh, such valuable information with us. Mm -hmm. We did not know that even, uh, you know, the, like you talked about cotton plants and all. Uh, so cotton is such a popular uh, clothing material yeah. in India. It is. And, mm. and uh, we had no idea that. Uh, yeah huge amounts of chemicals yeah and it's also yeah. causing many problems because of um farmers are committing suicide because they're getting huge debt by using genetically engineered cotton um yes. uh, varieties and that are linked to using you know using chemicals as well and they get into debt huge problem and yet there's some really great indian farmers doing things differently and uh living with the bugs and still managing to produce a crop that's economically viable because people are working with them um and buying that you know buying organic cotton that's a really good way of doing it yeah amazing vicky so okay. like uh, uh that's uh, brings us to the end of the session okay. and thank you very much uh, it's it's my, such a pleasure my book. having it's you my book yeah. <laughs> there's my book <laughs> yes pleasure to be here thank you for asking me and good luck with all, everything you're doing it's really brilliant thank you uh, thank you okay. so much for giving your time okay. evaluate them and agreeing to come and talk to us uh, here about okay. uh, the beautiful bugs okay brilliant <laughs> thank you so much once again okay. and uh, uh, thank you everybody who's joined us for the workshop and if you have anything uh, yeah. uh, else to like if you want to know more about the bugs if you want to read the book you can uh, uh, check it out on the link that I have uh, just shared on in the yeah. chat yeah and uh, yeah, and yeah. is there any way people, anybody, people can uh, reach out to you? Like, yes, well, on, yeah, on Instagram, my name, you know, it's at Vicky Hurd, V-I-C-K-I-H-I-R-D, and Twitter. So I do quite a lot of tweeting about tips and ideas and pictures. So do follow me oh, there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you so much, Vicky, once again okay. for joining us. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.